you yeah. to be here at this, this beautiful institute. Okay, so today I'm going to speak about uh, some joint work with uh, Matthias Erbar, uh, who was a PhD student in Bonn, and at the moment he's actually a, a postdoctoral fellow here at, at uh, MSRI in the uh, program on optimal transport, which uh, is taking place at the moment. Okay, so, um, so as you may know, uh, optimal transport has been a very active uh, field of research in the last uh, 15 years or so. And in particular, it has been very successful uh, in analysis and geometry in non-smooth settings. So in metric measure spaces with very little additional structure. So uh, what I would like to discuss today is how we can uh, bring some of the ideas in this, in this field to the setting of, of discrete spaces. Okay, so the, um, so the starting point of my talk is a, is a beautiful result um, by uh, Robert McCann from 94. And what he found is a very nice connection uh, between two well-known objects. So first of all, the, the well-known Boltzmann-Shannon entropy on, the, on probability measures on Rn. And secondly, uh, the two Wasserstein metric from optimal transport, which is a, is a distance on the space of probability measures defined in terms of an optimal transport problem. Okay, so here's the definition of entropy, uh, which is uh, just the usual thing. So if I have a reference measure m on the, on the space x, then for a probability measure mu, the entropy is defined by the usual formula. So by the integral of rho log rho uh, dm, where rho denotes the density of, uh, of mu with respect to m. So that's the usual thing. Uh, so what is this, this Wasserstein metric? So let me briefly introduce that. Um, so it's defined in terms of an optimal transport problem, uh, which is as follows. So let me explain the, the problem with the quadratic <coughs> cost function. So, um, so what you do is you consider a, a metric space, say a polished space, and on this space you consider two, uh, two probability measures, uh, mu and nu, and you regard this probability measure mu as the initial uh, distribution of some mass, say, say of a pile of sand. And this other probability measure nu uh, represents a target measure, and it describes the desired location of your mass. Yeah. So it's your job to transport the mass from its initial configuration nu to the second configuration nu. Well, and this transport is not for free, so there's a cost associated to this. And in this example, the cost will be the, the distance squared. Yeah. So to transport mass from x to y, you need to pay a price, which is the square of the distance. Yeah, and then the problem is to find the optimal solution, so to minimize the total cost. Okay, so mathematically, you define it in the following way. Um, so what you do is you consider gamma, which is a, is a coupling of mu and nu. Yeah. So just a probability measure on the product space with, uh, with marginals mu and nu. And then you integrate uh, the distance square against uh, this probability measure gamma, and you minimize overall gamma. So gamma is... Is a, is, a, is a transport plan which describes the transport from, from mu to mu. Okay, so this, uh, this quantity is, uh, is the square of, of what is the, called the Wasserstein metric. And um, if you want, you can also define it in, in probabilistic terms. Um, so it's equal uh, to the following expression. So you consider the expectation of the square distance between two random variables x and y. Uh, where x is supposed to have law mu and y is supposed to have law mu, nu. So that's the same, same definition. Okay, well this, this uh, metric turns out to have very nice properties. So uh, first of all, it is a metric on the space of probability measures, uh, which I call P2, so it's the space of probability measures with a finite second moment. Uh, and moreover, uh, this, this metric space of probability measures inherits uh, very nice, uh, various nice properties from, from the underlying space. So in particular, um, if the space, uh, the underlying space is a geodesic space, so that means that I can connect any two points by, uh, by a curve of, of constant speed, well then uh, the Wasserstein space is also a geodesic space. So, so what does that mean, you can connect any two by what? Ah, so, so, it, it, so you can connect any two points in your space by a curve of constant speed. So it means that, that there exists a curve, say, say U, uh, with the property that, uh, 
that uh, u of t minus u of t s, or, uh, I mean the distance between u t and u s is proportional to t minus s. So that's, that's a constant speed geodesic in a, in a metric space, so that's a purely metric notion. So most spaces we know are geodesic, I mean... Well, I mean... Um, I'm not saying that most spaces are, but most spaces we, we encounter in our work are... Well, maybe, well, it depends on, on, on the field, of course. So, I mean, this workshop is about discrete analysis. So, uh, uh, discrete spaces are, of course, typical spaces where, which are not geodesic. Yeah, so, you so, just to fix ideas, I yeah. well, say the mu and u are independent. Say you have a product measure. Yeah, so, so, I mean, if you look, look at this problem, so you can always find, uh, find one candidate. So, one candidate for gamma would be the product measure. Correct. Yeah. So, what happens there? So yeah, but, but usually this is a very inefficient way to transport the mass. Right. So what, um, and at the other extreme, what do you Okay, so at the other extreme, I'll come back to it uh, later on, but, but what you have very often, if this, this first measure is sufficiently nice, then uh, the optimal transport plan, so this, this measure gamma on the product space, is actually supported on the graph of a function. And that means that all the mass which is at some point x is distributed to, to exactly one point in your, in your target space. Yeah? So the mass doesn't split. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in one dimension, you can easily solve this explicitly. And in higher dimensions, so let's say in Rn, it is already uh, much less, uh, less clear. Okay. Right, so this is, uh, this is the optimal transport problem and the two Wasserstein metric. So here's the result by McCann. So what he showed is that if you look at the entropy, so on probability measures on Rn, then the entropy is always convex along geodesics in this Wasserstein space. Yeah. So if I look at the geodesic with respect to this metric, then and if I consider the entropy along this geodesic, then I get a, a convex function. Okay, so at first this might not sound too surprising. So of course, what is very easy to see is that uh, the entropy is always uh, a convex functional, just if you consider a linear interpolation. Okay, yeah, so, so here I imp implicitly uh, the probability, uh, the, the reference measure is just a Lebesgue measure. Yeah. So just a classical Boltzmann entropy. Start with something that has entropy. Well, so, so, so I, I take two prob probability measures on Rn, and I look at the, um, so the Wasserstein geodesic between them, and I look at the entropy, the behavior of the entropy along this geodesic. So along this connecting path in the space of probability measures. Okay. Okay, so the, the entropy is always convex along linear interpolation, yeah, just because the function x log x, x is a convex function. But this has nothing to do with this uh, result, because these geodesics are actually very far uh, from being uh, linear interpolation. Yeah. So let me briefly explain what these geodesics are. So how do I construct geodesics in the Wasserstein space? Okay, so I take two nice uh, probability measures, mu and nu, and I take an optimal coupling between them. Yeah, so an optimal measure on the product space, which is a minimizer in this uh, optimal transport problem. Okay, so as, as I mentioned before, if, uh, if mu is actually absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure, then it turns out that this measure gamma is always uh, supported on the graph of a function. So let's call that function psi. And what you can do if you have this function is you can interpolate this function. So I fix uh, t in 0, 1, and I define psi t to be the, uh, the linear interpolation between the identity map and psi. <coughs> and if I have this, ma this mapping psi t, I can define a uh, probability measure on the underlying space uh, to be the image measure of uh, this starting measure mu uh, under this mapping psi t. Okay, and this turns out to be the geodesic in the Wasserstein space between mu and u. So maybe it's, I can illustrate it uh, in a picture. So the idea is as follows. So here, suppose I have here some probability measure mu, and here's another probability measure mu. Then um, take a point here. Then um, this point is transported, for instance, to this point here. So there's this map t, uh, I mean the map psi, 
which sends this point to this point. And similarly, there's a, there's a thing over here. And so this, this line represents the mapping psi. And what you can do is you can just linear interpolate between this point and this point. So this is an interpolation, this is an interpolation. And you define probability measures uh, just by, by considering the collection of those points. And so this is mu, this is nu, and this is a mu t. So you get some, um, some curve in the space of measures, uh, which is defined using this optimal mapping psi. something strange in this theorem because there, there is an underlying object in entropy, it's a Lebesgue measure, you say. Yeah. And there is a distance in the W2. Yeah. So you can ask uh, if I take any other measure for the entropy, relative well, entropy with respect to this one, yeah. what should be the distance such that it is still convex? Yeah, yeah, so that is a natural question, but I, I, I come back to that later. Ah. Yeah. Right. Okay, so, so, so what I would like to emphasize here is that, so this interpolation is quite far from being, being linear. Um, um, what you actually do is you are heavily using the, the structure of the underlying space. Yeah, so you're really using the underlying space, in this case just Rn, to interpolate between these measures. So for instance, if you have a direct measure here and a direct measure here, then the interpolation in the Wasserstein space would be uh, just uh, a geodesic. Uh, well, it would be a direct mass which is supported on the geodesic. Yeah, so if I have a direct mass here and a direct mass here, then the interpolation will be just a direct mass traveling from one point to the other. So, so why do you say it's far from linear? I, I don't, I don't. Okay, so linear interpolation would be, if you, for instance, if you have direct masses, then the midpoint would be just one half times the direct at this point, plus one half in the other direct. But the, but the transport, I mean, so it is moving at a constant rate on each of these geodesics as you... Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So, so, so you lose, lose the, the geodesics in the underlying space. But not the, the linear structure of the space of probability measures. Okay, so this is a this is a what I just said. It's a highly nonlinear interpolation based on the geometry of the underlying space. Okay, so you may wonder um, what does this result actually tell you about uh, about R M? So um, so here's a generalization, and this is a generalization to Riemannian manifolds. So in this setting, the following result holds. So for a Riemannian manifold M, the following assertions are equivalent. So first um, is that the generalization of McCann's theorem holds. So namely that the entropy is convex uh, along geodesics in the Wasserstein space. And I actually slightly generalized this notion. So I used the notion of kappa convexity, which is just usual con uh, convexity um, involving an additional correction term. So that's the first condition, and this turns out to be equivalent to the fact that the Ricci curvature on my manifold is bounded from below by a constant kappa. Okay, so this is a, a remarkable result. Well, kappa is any real number. Okay, so this is a, this is a remarkable result. Um, for instance, because the second condition, uh, which involves the Ricci curvature, uses um, strongly the, the Riemannian structure of your, of your manifold. Yeah? So the Ricci curvature is a Riemannian object. Um, but the first condition is much more general. Yeah? So in order to, to state it, you only need to be able to make sense of the entropy. And for this, you need to have a reference measure. And you need to make sense of the Wasserstein metric. And for this, you need to have a distance on the underlying space. Why is it good to have such a <laughs> Why is it good? OK. <laughs> Well, there are, there are quite many, many consequences of this. So for instance, it's very useful uh, if you want to prove uh, geometric and functional inequalities. So you can prove uh, Dock Sobolev inequality directly from this. You can prove spectral gap, um, concentration of measure, uh, things like this. But this um, is also guaranteed by the second oh, That's right. That's right, of course. So in Riemannian manifolds, it is. Um, but this, this um, definition makes sense in much greater generality. So it allows you to go to, to much more general spaces. Exactly. So, so that's that's this to exactly. So, so that that's um, <laughs> that's what I'm going to say uh, actually right here. So this this allows you to define the notion of Ricci curvature in the setting of metric measure spaces just by imposing uh, this condition of convexity of the entropy along Wasserstein geodesics. So this is for 
if for every mu zero and mu one, or right. Yeah. So for every pair of probability measures should exist a geodesic in the Wasserstein space, such that the entropy satisfies this convexity inequality. There recently, perhaps I don't know. I'm sorry if you're, you know, this is. There are some definitions for curvature in graphs. How consistent are these? Or yeah, so the same thing. Or <laughs> so that, that will be the topic of my lecture. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, so that's that's. Uh, I'm I'm motivating that uh, the work on graphs. Okay, so this is a, a definition which makes sense in metric measure spaces, and it has some um, some nice properties. So it applies to a wide class of spaces. So not just to smooth spaces, but also to, to some, some sort of singular limits of, of Riemannian manifolds, for instance. Um, it has many consequences, so many uh, geometric and functional inequalities, uh, which I already uh, mentioned just before. And um, it turns out to be stable under notions of convergence of metric measure spaces. Um, uh, that's very useful to, to pass to the limit. And this will be very hard to do um, just by having the usual uh, definition of Ritchie curvature. Like Lagrangian here, uh, entropy transport? Exactly, yeah. Right, okay, so, so the strongest applications, uh, so yeah, actually maybe all of those are valid uh, if, if kappa is strictly positive, yeah. But you get some other results also for negative kappa. Okay, so maybe let's, let's go back one slide and let me explain um, the intuition behind these results in terms of, of this little cartoon. <coughs> so the idea is that, um, so you consider here, for instance, the sphere, yeah, which is a space of positive curvature. And you take two probability measures, say one of them is supported in this little green ball, and the other one is supported into the other green ball. Um, and what you do is you consider an interpolation between them in the space of probability measures, which will be supported onto this red ball. And now, because this space is positively curved, the geodesics in the underlying space, they tend to diverge at first, <coughs> and then they uh, converge back together uh, at the end. So that means that this... Uh, this mass is actually more spread out in the middle than it is at the, at the end points. And being more spread out means that you have lower entropy with this sign convention that I'm using. Yeah, so that explains that you have this convex uh, profile of the entropy. Is it enough to check this condition for mu zero and mu one that are, for example, uniform on balls? It, this condition you said it has to hold for all mu's. Yeah. All choices, but... Um, okay. Okay, um, yeah, you, you, can, you can approximate, so you, you can do things like this, but, but, but basically you have to check for, for, all, for all probability measures or for all, for dense class of measures in some sense. Okay, um, so let's, let's move on. Um, so this, this is, uh, works in very general metric measure spaces, but uh, well, the topic of the talk is what, what will happen in discrete spaces? Okay, so maybe the natural thing in this audience uh, would be to, to, uh, to look at the two-point space. So a very trivial situation in some sense, but already uh, quite interesting. Uh, and just to fix notation, let mu alpha be the probability measure which has mass 1 minus alpha at 0 and mass alpha at 1. Um, well, then it's quite easy to, to compute explicitly the Wasserstein distance. And what you find is that the distance between mu alpha and mu beta is uh, proportional uh, to the square root of alpha minus beta. Uh, so the square root is basically because you're considering two Wasserstein metric. Yeah, so there was this quadratic cost function, and at the end of the day, you take the square root. Okay, now suppose that we have a geodesic in the, in the Wasserstein space of probability measures. Yeah. So this is something which we need in this uh, definition of Lotvila and Ishtuan. Okay, so what does it mean to be a geodesic? It means that I can uh, write the distance between two of those uh, measures along this curve, uh, and this distance will be proportional to t minus s for some <coughs> s and c. But on the other hand, we just saw um, that uh, this distance can also be computed by the formula above, and this gives the square root of alpha t minus alpha s. OK, but now if you look at, at, at the left and the right hand side, what you see is that alpha is actually uh, Hilder continuous, but with Hilder exponent 2. Well, and this cannot happen. So it means that this curve is constant. 
Well, in particular, this little argument shows that there are no uh, W2 geodesics in the Wasserstein space of probability measures. And that's not a coincidence because it's actually true that uh, this Wasserstein space is a geodesic space if and only if the underlying space itself is geodesic. <coughs> if you rescale. Um, well, I mean, rescale depends, of course, on how you, how you do it, but, um, well, the, the problem is really the square root behavior. Yeah. And you, you don't get rid of it but using w Wasserstein 2. Yeah, so, so, so W1 um, would be much better in this sense because it would be just proportional to alpha minus uh, beta. Um, but in the continuous case, there are good reasons why uh, W2 is a, is a much nicer metric than W1. And I will, well, for, in some... Uh, with, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> so for some purposes, W2 is, is nicer than W1. For other purposes, maybe W1 is, is, is nicer. Uh, How does this uh, property behave under uh, taking products? Okay, that's also one thing I'll speak about. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so the moral of this, of this, of this slide is that, that this definition of Lutz, Sturm, and Villani does not apply to discrete spaces because, uh, well, there's nothing to check. You don't have any geodesics. But you could turn it, for example, into include the edge between the two vertex, one edge curve. Right? I mean, would that fix it? Okay, yeah, so then... It would turn it into an interval. Right, yeah, so then you're basically back in the setting of metric measure spaces. So that will be kind of covered by this Lutz, Villani, Sturm uh, theory. Uh, but we would really like to consider just discrete graphs. Okay. Um, so in recent years, there have been uh, quite a lot of uh, works on, on, on the topic of, of establishing a notion of, of, of Ritchie curvature in discrete spaces. So here's a list of works, which is certainly not exhaustive. So there has been, uh, been a nice theory by, by Jan Olivier, which has also been... Um, found by, by other people, so Summer, Julien in particular. Uh, and this is based on, on the W1 metric. So it's based on, uh, on a contraction condition with respect to W1, which uh, can be traced back to the work of the Bushin. Um, there's been another approach, uh, which is in the spirit of Lot Villani Sturm. Um, so that has been developed by, by Bonsukat and Sturm. <coughs> and what they did is, well, they said, well, if there are no geodesics, maybe there are some approximate geodesics. So they uh, relax this notion <coughs> of geodesic a bit and consider it a sort of relaxed notion of convexity uh, along these geodesics. And this is, uh, works uh, quite nicely in discrete spaces. Well, then there's another line of research which is based on, uh, based on uh, Bakri Emery uh, criterion, which is some sort of uh, algebraic uh, condition which, which characterizes uh, curvature. Uh, and there's been a lot of activity in this direction. Um, by, uh, by S.T. Yao and, and his, his collaborators. Uh, and there's another, another possibility which is based on, on a discrete version of displacement interpolation, but I'm not <coughs> going to uh, discuss that in detail because uh, you will hear about it after the coffee break in, in uh, Prasad's talk. Okay, so what we would like to do is we would like to find a notion of curvature which is uh, really in the spirit of, of Lotvilani Sturm and which allows us to prove uh, sharp functional inequality. Okay, so, so the question which arises is, well, why is this, this Wasserstein 2 metric uh, such a nice uh, metric? Um, so there are a couple of reasons, but one important reason is there's the, the following result, um, which has been very, uh, very influential, um, and it's due to Jordan Kindelera Otto at the end of the 90s. And they found uh, a new way to interpret the heat equation. So what they found is that the heat flow is the gradient flow of the entropy with respect to the Wasserstein 2 metric. Okay, so what does, this, what does this statement mean? So in particular, what does it mean to be a gradient flow in a metric space? Okay, so there are various ways to, to make sense of such a notion, but let me explain briefly one of them. So let's go back to the, to the very classical setting of Rn and take a nice a function phi, which is smooth and convex on Rm, then for a curve u in the space Rm, the following are equivalent. So first of all, it is a gradient flow, so it solves the gradient flow equation, meaning that u dot equals minus quad phi of u. And this condition turns out to be equivalent to a, a system of inequalities, 
which are called evolution variational inequalities, and they look like this. So there's the uh, left hand side as, as the metric, and here's the functional. Okay, so this uh, there has been a, a very rich uh, theory recently on, on this topic, uh, in particular developed by, by Ambrosio, Gili, and Salabé. Now, one remarkable thing about this, this, this second condition is again, um, that if you look at it, then you see at the left hand side there's only the metric, and at the right hand side there's only, only the functional. <coughs> so uh, you, you're not using anything of the smooth structure of Rn, and you can take this as a definition of gradient flow in a metric space. Okay, and this turns out to be a very fruitful notion, and in particular, uh, this allows us to formulate uh, this result by Jordan Kindernero Otto. So what they showed is that if I have a solution to the, to the usual heat equation, then uh, these evolution variational inequalities holds. And these are just the same equations as, as you see below, in which I replaced the, uh, the square distance here uh, by the squared Wasserstein metric, and I replaced the functional uh, on the right here by the entropy. Okay, so this is a, um, well, a remarkable way to look at, at the heat equation. Um, so in particular, it, it implies the, well, the very uh, simple and, and, of course, very well-known result that the entropy decreases along the heat flow. But it actually tells you much more. So it tells you really that the, the whole uh, evolution of the heat equation is really determined by the entropy. So the heat flow is really the curve uh, which tries to minimize the entropy uh, as rapidly as possible. Uh, and this is measured in some sense using the Wasserstein metric. If it was not convex? Okay, if it's not convex, then, then this notion is not, not, uh, not a correct notion, but there are other ways to make sense of gradient flow symmetric spaces. But let me just uh, uh, state this notion for a moment. Okay, so this result has been very, uh, very um, influential, and there have been many uh, generalizations, uh, especially in, in to all kinds of, of, uh, of more general spaces. So, so Riemannian manifolds. Um, some infinite dimensional spaces, um, sub Riemannian spaces, um, and at the end there has been a very general result by Ampozio, Gili, and Savare, which showed that in, in very general classes of metric measure spaces, um, this notion of gradient flow uh, coincides uh, with a classical notion of gradient flow based on the Dirichlet energy. Okay, so the question uh, which arises now, is there a version of this result in a discrete setting? Okay, so let me uh, just uh, fix the notation, which is very, very standard. So <coughs> my discrete setting is I consider a finite set, uh, and on this finite set I have a Markov kernel, which I denote by K, uh, and I assume that there exists uh, an invariant probability measure which is reversible. So which just means in this case that these uh, uh, detailed balance conditions hold. Okay, then of course there's a, there's a way to, to speak about heat flow, so I can write a discrete Laplacian uh, by its usual formula, and the heat semigroup is then just the, the, uh, the semigroup generated by this discrete Laplacian, and this is just a continuous time Markov semigroup associated with this Markov kernel. So there's a natural heat flow in this setting. <coughs> okay, there's also, of course, a natural entropy. Um, so again, to fix notation, so P of X will be uh, the space of probability densities, so all non-negative functions rho uh, which are probability densities with respect to pi. And the entropy is just relative entropy with respect to pi. Okay. So again, let's, let's do the, the simplest thing first. Let's go to the two-point space. So my space is 0, 1. I take the kernel for a simple random walk, uh, and I take the invariant measure, which is just a uniform measure on a two-point space. And recall that mu alpha is this convex combination of the rock masses. So then the question becomes, is it true that the heat flow on, on this two-point space is the gradient flow of the entropy with respect to the Wasserstein metric? Well, here's the answer. <laughs> the answer is disappointing. The answer is no. And the reason is that this Wasserstein metric doesn't behave very well in a, the discrete case. So there's this square root scaling. And because of that, um, it's not, not hard to show that you cannot have uh, any absolutely continuous curves. And in particular, um, you can have any gradient flows whatsoever with respect to this Wasserstein <coughs> metric. 
okay, so if we, um, if we have this result and we don't like the answer, then we'll just change the, the question. <coughs> so is it then true that the heat flow is the gradient flow with respect to another metric on the space of probability measures on the two-point space, which is again 0, 1, if you like? Uh, and now the answer is much better, so the answer turns out to be yes. Uh, so here's a little proposition. The heat flow is the gradient flow of the entropy with respect to some metric, which I denote by this curly W. And this is given by this uh, uh, explicit uh, formula, which uh, might not be the first metric that you would uh, come up with in a, in a discrete setting. <laughs> Maybe the second there. Uh, uh, all right. If it is the gradient of some metric, then that metric is unique? Uh, okay, so in, in this setting, it's, it's, it's unique. But in, in more general <laughs> settings, it's, there are probably many, many other uh, options because you're basically fixing. This setting means the two point space. No, the two point space. Yeah. So basically, you're, you're somehow just prescribing the, the metric in only one direction of your tangent space, in the direction where the gradient flow is moving. Mm -hmm. And you have a lot of freedom in other directions. Okay, but because it's one dimensional, you don't have any additional freedom in this two point space. Okay, so question, how can we generalize this to a general discrete setting? Okay, so... Is it minus tangent? Sorry? Is hyperbolic tangent? Should this ring some bell in my mind? No, it didn't ring a bell with me, but maybe uh, to some other people at the OOT. What was R there? Can we stare at the... Okay, so, so you have this mysterious function. Well, what is R? Oh, it's a function of R, and you integrate with respect to R. The yeah. variables. So this is a so let me draw the graph at least. So, so, oh, I see. so you have this function between 0 and 1, and it looks something like this. And so this is the integrand. Right. And what you do is you're just, the distance is obtained by integrating, uh, well, by this area, mm -hmm. the integrating between alpha and beta. Okay, but I don't expect you to see anything uh, very clear in, in this in this formula. Okay, so um, so to get an idea how to to, to do the more general discrete <coughs> setting, uh, let's go back to the continuous case. Um, and it turns out that there is a very nice uh, alternative way to, to to look at the Wasserstein metric. So how does this work? So what you do is instead of just consider the optimal transport problem between uh, two measures, what you do is you look at actually uh, a curve in a space of measures. Okay. So you look at a uh, a trajectory, so rho t is a, is a t-dependent uh, probability uh, measure. And if this curve is nice and smooth, then I can always write uh, the associated continuity equation where psi is, uh, is an appropriate vector field. So what's the, the interpretation of this equation? So here's a picture. So you see here this, this curve in the space of probability measures. And if you uh, regard this probability measure as a cloud of particles, what you do is you follow the trajectory of each of these particles yeah. and you look at the velocity factor field. Well, and this velocity factor field is psi, which is precisely the psi appearing in this continuity equation. Okay, well, given such a curve uh, rho, there are in general many choices of psi, but there is some uniqueness because for every t, you can find a unique gradient factor field such that this continuity equation holds. Okay, and now there's some, some idea which may seem uh, a bit strange at first, but it's turned out to be very uh, useful. Um, so this factor, felt, uh, factor field uh, grad psi um, is now regarded as, as some sort of a tangent factor on my space of probability measures. So given a curve, I can write it in this form, and for any dt rho, which is, is a, say, in some sense a tangent factor, there exists a unique gradient uh, which I can put here in the continuity equation. So because of this one-to-one -one correspondence, I might think about this gradient as being some sort of a tangent factor. And now I can define an inner product on, on this, on this uh, tangent space, and this inner product is just the, uh, the inner product at rho is just the weighted L2 inner product of these, of these gradients. So weighted with respect to the measure rho. Okay. So this might seem like a very complicated way to to, to define a, a Riemannian distance. Um, but here's a nice thing. So let's now write the associated uh, 
the associated distance function to this Riemannian metric. <coughs> so the so the distance function is defined by the by the usual formula. So this is just a uh, usual formula from Riemannian <coughs> geometry written in this particular case. So you're minimizing the square of the length of a tangent vector uh, along curves, and these curves I can write in the form of a continuity equation uh, with the right boundary conditions. Uh, and if you look at this, this expression, it has a very natural interpretation. So, so this quantity here, so it's, it's the squared norm of my velocity vector field times this, this mass, so it is actually a kinetic energy. So the squared velocity integrated against the mass. So what you're looking at, you're looking at a minimization problem for the kinetic energy. And the remarkable thing, which was found by Bunemou and Brenier, was this did, that this formula is actually an equivalent way to describe the Wasserstein metric. So the Wasserstein 2 metric is equal to this minimization problem in the space of uh, uh, curves in the space of probability measures. So this, this came from, from fluid mechanics, uh, this, this, this kind, of, uh, kind of ideas. Okay, now we have this, this representation, and now the idea would be in the discrete case, maybe we can, can do something based on this formula, also in the discrete setting. <coughs> so here is once more the same formula, and now in the discrete setting, let's try to generalize this formula. So here's the definition. So I'm going to define a metric in this discrete setting, just by copying the, the things above and, and replacing them with their, with their discrete uh, analogs. So step by step, so here's the integral in time. Uh, the integral in space is replaced by a discrete sum, and the Lebesgue uh, measure is replaced by this, this sort of uh, conductance on the, on the edge of my, of my graph. So k was the kernel and pi was the invariant measure. Well, the gradient is replaced by the discrete gradient, yeah, so there's this finite difference. Um, well, the next step would be to insert this row, so the density. But th then there's a problem. So what's the problem in the discrete case? Well, this row um, is a probability measure, which is defined on vertices of my discrete uh, space, my graph. But on the other hand, this, this discrete gradient is defined on edges. So here, I'm, in the continuous case, I'm multiplying something, uh, this gradient at x, with this mass uh, at the same point x. But in the discrete case, it's not, not completely obvious what to do because they're not row and graph psi are not defined on the same space. So it's not clear uh, how to define this product. OK, so here's a, here, this turns out to be the solution, which comes completely out of the blue, I would say. So the idea is you, you, uh, you consider some sort of an average between the, the density at the point x and the density at the point y. So I define a quantity rho hat of x and y to be this sort of weighted average between rho x and rho y. Uh, and you can explicitly calculate this integral and you find this, this quotient of discrete uh, derivatives. So this you found by reverse engineering? Exactly, exactly, yeah. So I, I will come back later and explain a bit how, how I came up with this, with this object. But you see, it's some sort of a funny way to take the average between rho x and, and rho y. So we plug this in uh, instead of rho x, and we do the same thing with the continuity equation. So basically, we're replacing all the, all the objects with their natural discrete counterparts. So there's a discrete gradient, there's a discrete divergence, which would be a sum over neighbors. And this rho is again replaced by this, by this logarithmic mean. OK. So that's the definition of a metric. Indeed, um, it has some nice properties. This is, again, not just a metric, but it comes from a, from a Riemannian structure. Uh, and it's, this Riemannian structure is very much analogous to the continuous setting. So I can characterize the tangent space uh, in terms of discrete uh, gradients. Uh, and here's, here's the result, which really justifies uh, this definition in some sense. So the discrete heat flow. So just given by this continuous time mark of chain is the gradient flow of the entropy with respect to this metric. So that's what we want. So let me remark that this result was found, uh, well, in the way that I stated, it was in my paper, uh, but uh, very similar independent works um, um, whereby uh, by a group of people at, at Georgia Tech, so Chao, Wang, Li, and Zhu, 
uh, and also by Alexander Duke in, in Berlin. Okay, so, so what might seem quite mysterious is why, why do I, we have this funny logarithmic mean? So let me try to, to explain that by given, giving a short uh, formal proof of, of, this, uh, of this JKO theorem. So it, uh, it goes as follows. So consider uh, a curve, rho and psi, which satisfies this continuity equation. Then what you do is you differentiate the entropy along this curve. So if you do that, because of the rho log rho, you get a log rho, or plus one, but the one cancels. And the chain rule uh, gives you this divergence. Okay, then you integrate by parts, so you get the gradient of log rho times this rho uh, graph psi. And now if you go back to this definition of this Riemannian structure, you see that this quantity is exactly the inner product in my tangent space at rho. So it's the inner product of this graph psi and the graph of log rho. And by the definition of gradient, uh, this means that I can interpret the, the gradient in the Wasserstein space as the gradient of log rho. So think about this for two minutes, then you see that it's, that's the case. Um, on the other hand, Suppose that I have a solution to the heat equation, then I can write it as a, as a solution to the continuity equation. So I can write dt rho as the divergence of the gradient of rho, and then I can write rat rho as rho times rat psi, provided that psi is minus log of rho. And what does this mean? Well, it means that we have this continuity equation with this log rho, um, and in this Riemannian structure, you can formulate this by saying that the tangent factor along the heat flow equals minus the gradient of log rho. And if you now <coughs> combine these two, two things, then you see that the gradient, of the gradient flow of the entropy gives you the heat equation. Okay, so this, this little argument um, can actually also be used in the discrete case if you uh, replace gradients by discrete gradients and so on. Um, but there's one place which is very speci specific for the continuous setting, and that's this last identity. So what we did here is we wrote grad rho as rho times grad of log rho, yeah. which is the chain rule. And of course, we don't have a chain rule uh, in a discrete case. <coughs> so what we need is we need to have some sort of uh, substitute for the chain rule, and that's exactly uh, why this, this uh, logarithmic mean appears, because somehow this compensates for the lack of a discrete chain rule. So it's just defined uh, in order to satisfy this formula. And so we can uh, write the discrete gradient of rho uh, as this logarithmic mean times the discrete gradient of log rho. So it allows us to have a chain rule for, for exactly one formula. Uh, yeah? Yeah. I have a question. So the first step, the derivative of entropy rho t. Yeah. In, uh, in discrete, you can get the Dirichlet form E F T log F T. Right. So that would suggest no, no, no. something. Rho T is, uh, is not. Ah, yeah, yeah. Not from for, the, for the heat flow. Yes, yes. It's, uh, yeah, it's for the for heat flow, you get yes. the log row. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is this is just yeah. any curve. So along any curve, we compute the derivative yes. of the entropy. Yeah, so we it's get not this. Not this. E to the T log plus. No, no. So, so if, if, if this would be the heat equation, then this, this graph psi would be graph of log rho, yes. and you would get this, the, the thing which you mentioned. So you get the Dirichlet form of graph log rho and uh, graph rho. Doesn't compare well with the other one? Well, in, yeah, so, okay, so in some sense, um, so, so, so you, okay, so if you differentiate the entropy along the heat flow, you get the Dirichlet form of, of <coughs> log rho and rho, but you want to interpret this as some Riemannian tensor. So you want to interpret this as something quadratic. And you want to write this as something quadratic in log rho. And this logarithmic mean uh, allows you to write it as the logarithmic mean times the square of the discrete gradient of log rho. So in, in some sense, it allows you to write something quadratic even in the discrete case. OK, so let's now go back to, to, uh, to Lot Sturm Villani. So now that we have this metric, which in some sense takes over the role of the Wasserstein metric, um, we can do a, a very naive thing. So just mimicking the definition by Lot Villani Storm. So we say that uh, a Markov kernel has a lower bound on the Ritchie curvature by some constant kappa 
if the entropy is kappa convex along geodesics, but now we use the new metric instead of the Wasserstein two metric. So here's a cartoon which illustrates this, this idea. So, so here's a discrete space with just three points. You consider a curve in the space of measures. So you have, uh, so this, this gray uh, area is supposed to represent the manifold of probability measures. So this gives you a curve in this, in this space. And what you would like is that the entropy is convex along this curve. Okay, so that's a nice definition. So what can you do with this? Um, so what we can do is we can obtain functional inequalities. So suppose that we have a reversible Markov chain. Um, and consider the following quantity, which is, uh, is a discrete analog of the Fisher information. So it's the, the thing which, which Prasad was just mentioning. It's, it's really the Dirichlet form of, of Grad rho and, and, or the Dirichlet form of rho and log rho. So there's a discrete gradient of rho and a discrete gradient of log rho. And this quantity is actually obtained if you differentiate the entropy of, uh, along, the, along the heat flow. Okay, so here's the result. So what we prove uh, in, in the paper with Matthias Erbar is that if the Ritchie curvature is bounded from below by a positive constant kappa, then we obtain the modified log Sobolev inequality, which gives you a lower bound of the entropy in terms of this Fisher information. Uh, and there's a constant, which is exactly the constant uh, appearing here as lower bound in the curvature. Okay, so this notion has been quite well studied in discrete uh, settings, in particular in the work by Bobkov and, and Tetali. Um, and why is this a useful inequality? Um, well, this, this result uh, is actually uh, equivalent to the exponential decay uh, of the entropy along the heat flow. Well, that's just because this quantity is the derivative of the entropy. So just by Cromwell argument, you see that this, this exponential decay has to be Okay, so in the, in, the, in the classical setting of Riemannian manifolds, this result is due to Bakri Emery. And with the notion of curvature, we, uh, we, op we obtain this, this, this discrete uh, counterpart of this result. Okay, so here's another result, which is uh, a generalization of a result by, or not a generalization, but um, an analog in a discrete case of a result by Otto and Villani. So what we can show is that if we have a modified log Sobolev inequality, then we obtain uh, what we call a modified Talagran inequality, which is the following inequality, which gives us a bound for the distance, so this curly W distance, between rho and the stationary measure. So that is just the density one. Uh, and this bound is in terms of the entropy. Okay, so this, this inequality has been also widely studied in, in continuous settings um, if you replace this metric by the usual uh, Wasserstein metric. So both with uh, W1 and W2 has been widely studied and they are, these are intimately related to the to a concentration of measure. Okay, but in a discrete case, um, the analogous inequality with, with W2 uh, actually never holds. So even on a two-point space, it's wrong. So here are some remarks. So if we have this inequality, um, then we can obtain also, also a Poincaré inequality, which is the usual thing. Uh, and we also obtain a T1 transportation inequality, uh, which is the same uh, as Talagran inequality, but now we have a W1 uh, metric. So this inequality has been studied in particular by, by Bobkov and, and, and Gutzen. Okay. Um, is it the, uh, oh, maybe this is your next slide. Uh, how, how do you prove that the certain space has a uh, right. curvature? That is, uh, oh. I think, is, is, yeah, it's the next slide. <laughs> so here. I'm just curious, uh, maybe it's not so interesting in the discrete setting, but uh, is it, uh, can you deduce the, the original uh, Sobolev inequality in a natural way uh, for the Jupiter space from the, I mean, the, the, uh, the entropy of F squared less than uh, the Sobolev regarding constant uh, log P minus log uh, 1 minus P. Or so, so, so you mean? To go from the two-point space you, to, the, to the cube or something? Or? No, but you, you say that you can deduce <coughs> the logarithm. Oh, I see, I see. But can you, can you deduce uh, an or, uh, a usual logarithm? Okay, um, 
so, so in a discrete case, there are, there are various versions of log sobolev inequality, which, which would be equivalent in the continuous case, but they are not equivalent in, in a discrete setting. So, and um, these, these connections between various forms have also been uh, studied by Bobkov and Tetali, for instance. And this is one form of log sobolev inequality, but it's one of the weaker forms. So this is not a... Um, okay, so there are, there are other, other, other versions of this, uh, of this log sobolev, um, but they are not equivalent in discrete cases. Yeah, no, but, but can you deduce? Uh, can you deduce? Uh, so you cannot deduce it. No, no. So you cannot go from from this one to. Well, maybe there are some inequalities you can deduce, but uh, not that I'm aware of that you can go to other forms of log sobolev. No, no, but not from the modified. Modified, <laughs> but from the from the Ricci definition. Oh, oh, no, I see what you mean. Ah, sorry. Okay. Can you get the there's the form? I see. Yeah. I see. No, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Probably the, the it's very natural. Uh, the, there is this heat flow. So when you take the derivative, you get the Dirichlet flow, modified Dirichlet flow. So it's very natural that you get the modified of the Sobolev inequality and not the other one. So yeah, so, so, so this. So it's, I mean, uh, yeah. for that reason, I think you just get the modified, which is very natural with your setting. Yeah, so, so this, this <coughs> modified log Sobolev inequality comes very easily from this from this gradient flow structure. Uh, and I, I don't think it's possible to get any other or to get a stronger form. I think is that in a lot of cases, uh, why we care about log sublevel inequality in, uh, in, in hypercube in context of uh, Boolean functions is because of hypercontractivity. Right. follows from, but uh, do, do they also from, follow from modified log sublevel inequality of this form or not? No, so you need a stronger form of log sublevel to, to, to go to hypercube. Well, there is some form of hypercontractivity, but... Um, so, so is there any sort of conclusion you can draw from it? For LQ norms or things like that? No, so as far as I know, you need a stronger stronger form of log sobolev. But please correct me if I'm, we if I'm wrong. We prove. You carry the usual proof and proof of hypercontractive. Okay, so, so maybe let me just finish my talks by mentioning some examples of, 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 of Ricci, <laughs> Ricci bounds. Okay, um, so here's some results by Milke, so who, who did some independent work. So he proved that in the case of, of finite Markov chains, um, it's always possible to find some constant that they uh, for which the Ricci curvature is bounded from below by this constant. Now, but it might be very negative. And even in the setting of finite Markov chains, this is a non-trivial result, because actually this manifold, so this Riemannian manifold of probability measures becomes degenerate at the boundary. <coughs> so this is non-trivial. <coughs> so other results by Milke are, are in one-dimensional situations. Um, so what he showed is that certain discretizations of Fokker-Planck equations uh, behave well with respect to this Ricci curvature. So in some sense you uh, can obtain in the, in the limits. So passing from discrete to continuous, you can obtain the, the classical <coughs> continuous results. So here are some, some more results which uh, were joined with Matthias Erbar. <coughs> uh, so this is a way to, to go to product chains. So it's a tensorization result, which tells you that if you have a, a bunch of Markov chains uh, and you have a lower bound on the curvature for each of them, then you also obtain automatically uh, a lower bound on the Ricci curvature for the product. And this, this lower bound for the product is obtained by uh, the minimum of the, of the curvatures of your individual components. And you see here is a 1 over n that is just uh, because of the scaling that we're, we're using. So it allows you to obtain uh, dimension independent bounds. And in particular, we obtain sharp bounds for the discrete hypercube. So we recover. Uh, using this uh, Ricci curvature, we recover known uh, functional inequalities, like the known uh, modified log Sobolev inequality on the cube, and uh, the Poincaré inequality, and both with sharp constants. Okay, I think I'm out of time, so um, thank you very much. A few questions, maybe one or two, or comments. Uh, in the definition, you take a uh, uh, kernel, can you take transition that does not sum to one? Uh, you, I'm, I'm ah, thinking okay. about like, you know, to take the line and uh, you want mm. Poisson measure to be the invariant measure with Bers and Des or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So you need to, you know, can you do that? Or is there any way to generalize all this? Yeah, yeah so that, that's no problem at all. So you, you can, uh, so this normalization was just for, for, for convenience, but you can just apply this to any continuous time mark of chain. So even if you don't have, uh, uh, exponential transition rates with with, um, with parameter one, so you can you can do what uh, what you're suggesting. 
without any problem. And with the, with the same, with almost with the same notation, in the same statements. I can create a small remark, comment. Uh, recently, Vershik suggested to to call Wasserstein distance Kantarovich. <laughs> <laughs> which will be much more unfair and it's hero to historical paper about this. It was a mistake by De Bruch in scientific who didn't know the work of Kantarovich. So in case it is equal to two, people like Kantarovich yeah. Kantarovich. <laughs> I think that's a good suggestion. <laughs> but it's hard to change. Uh, uh, we only told it's too late. But Gershwin says, no, it's never late. <laughs> Good, let's end this now.